This is Dolores Cannon again tonight with the Metaphysical Hour. And we're going to have a guest tonight, too, and it's going to be very interesting. But first, let me give out the free number. The telephone number is 877-876-5227. That is the toll-free number for all over the world. Anybody can call in from anywhere in the world and talk to us. But as I've found in the past, we don't get very many call-ins. And people have told me when I've been at lectures, they said, we don't want to call in. We just want to listen. So we do know they're out there and they are listening. But tonight my guest is Harold McCoy. And he's the founder of the ORI, which is the Ozark Research Institute in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And that's the nearest town from where I live, the nearest big city. But Harold and I go back at least 25 years. I was thinking about it a while ago, and, you know, Harold has to be about 25 years because it was back in the early 80s is when we all first got together. And we more or less all started out at the same time because Harold was just finding out what he could do at the same time that I was finding out what I could do. Now, Harold... Uh, I'm going to ask you to give your background, but I just want to tell a little bit about you, and then you can fill in more of the details. Is okay. that okay? Sounds good. All right. Because um, Harold was a military man for a long time, and you were the last person you would think that would switch to being a healer. But now he does remote healing, and he can do it from anywhere in the world, and he's able to see inside the bodies and to manipulate the organs and heal the persons at a long distance. And I'm going to let you clarify if I'm not getting it exactly right, but he's teaching this method now in many places, and that's what the Ozark Research Institute is all about. They just had their school, um, just this last week, they had another school where they're teaching these methods. Okay, Harold, let's tell you, First, about your background. Okay. I was uh, born and raised here in uh, northwest Arkansas. But when I was 17, I went into the United States Army, and I stayed for 24 years. <clears throat> and I retired as a major from military intelligence. I, I put in, uh, I was in the Korean War, and I was in Vietnam twice for two tours of duty. And I've been stationed all over the country. And uh, I got started doing this stuff by dowsing. Uh, some people may know it as water witching. It's a, it's a way to find the underground flowing veins of water and other things. You, do, you know, you can map dows if you can douse a map and find things. But you found out you could do these things after you got out of the uh, Army, didn't you? Yeah, I was not doing any of these in the Army. A total uh, reversal. 180 degrees. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember you used to be the international president of the Dowser Society. Weren't yes, you? I was uh, the president for four years. Uh huh. And their headquarters are uh, up in Vermont. And so. But actually, you were enough, doing the dowsing before you discovered the healing. Yes. Uh, you know, dowsing is it's just it's all mind phenomena. That's that's what I call it, mind phenomena. Yeah. And, I mean, if you can find an underground flowing vein of water, I mean, just from walking on top of the ground here, or dowsing, I mean, that just has to do with the mind. <clears throat> and and after I've done that, I was for four years, and that's actually how the Ozark Research Institute got started. Uh, because I, you know, I was kind of doing some healing work, but the, the dowsers, the charter wouldn't allow you to openly do any healing work. Oh, I didn't know that they were uh, distinguishing between the two. Yeah, well, <clears throat> when you have a non-profit tax-exempt organization, you have to stay within the the box you put yourself in, the Articles of Incorporation and your charter. Uh-huh. And their charter didn't say anything about dowsing, so they couldn't do any of that stuff legally. <clears throat> yeah. And when I was president, uh, I was doing some healing, and I guess you could call me a closet healer, actually. <laughs> and, okay. And uh, 
I really wanted to do, uh, be able to do it openly, you know, I just wanted to be able to, to work on people. So, uh, so that's the reason I started the Ozark Research Institute. And when I wrote the charter for this, the Articles Incorporation, the, the, the first thing that I, the purpose, number one, was to determine what part mind plays in spontaneous remission or miraculous healing of chronic or life-threatening diseases. Yeah. N- number two is to, uh, research, to research the healing technique of laying on the hands. And, and so that's what we're doing. We got the, our charter approved by the state of Arkansas, and we got uh, the nonprofit <coughs> uh, tax exempt status by the U.S. government, the Internal Revenue Service. So. Oh, okay. So, that's so now they can't uh, tell you what you can and can't do. <clears throat> that's right, as long as I'm within the, the charter, yeah. Uh huh. And we had. But um, you had a fascinating story of how the Ozark Research Institute began. Because I remember, you know, I go all the way back. I'm a charter member. Yeah, you are. I remember yeah. when you first started out, there was an interesting story, and it had to do with dowsing, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, yeah, I can, uh, you know, when how, I was. How it all began. That's how it all began, yeah. You know, uh, when I was, like I say, when I was president, I was always wanting, in the back of my mind, I wanted to start an organization. So every time I would do meditation, I would just see myself standing up in front of a group talking about healing. Uh-huh. And uh, as president of the, or, as, uh, the Dowsers, they published a little journal, and my name was in there as president with my phone number. So one day I got a phone call from this lady in Berkeley, California, and she said she'd heard about the mouth dowsing, <clears throat> And she said uh, her daughter, and her nine-year-old daughter, had been playing her harp in a, in a Christmas musical. It was a four-night deal, four-night uh, concert. Yeah. And on the third night, someone went in the theater and stole her harp. Oh. Now, this harp was, you know, could never be replaced. It was one of three made from the same bird's eye maple tree. It was made by the master harp maker in the United States. You know, it just it had a, a, a history that could just not be replaced. <clears throat> so she called me and asked me if I would douse and try to find her harp. Now this is in uh, she lived in Berkeley, California, and this the harp was way been, back in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time ago. Yeah, <clears throat> and the harp had been stolen. Uh, from a theater over in Oakland, you know, just Berkeley and Oakland right across from each other. Yeah. And, and that's where the harp had been stolen from. And so as I'm talking to her, I'm dowsing. And, you know, by dowsing, you can get yes and no answers on, on questions. So I'm just asking if that harp was still in that area, and my, my pendulum told me yes. So when I told her, I said, okay, send me a street map of Oakland and Berkeley. And so... A couple of days later, the Federal Express came up my driveway with this big old map, the street map of Oakland and Berkeley. And uh, I laid that map out on a dining room table. And she also sent me a a picture of the harp. I laid the map out on the dining room table, and I held the, the picture of, my harp, of the harp in my hand. And I said, is this harp in the area represented by this map? And my dowsing told me it was. So I've got this map laying on this big dining room table with all, you know, and there's a lot of streets in Oakland and Berkeley, and that was a street map, and, and you know, there's, there's a million streets. And so I started on the left side of the map, and I got a straight edge, it was a yardstick, <clears throat> and, and what I was saying, I said, okay, when, and I'm going to bring this yardstick across the map, and when, when the edge of the yardstick gets over the intersection nearest that harp, give me a yes. And again, you can get yes and no answers. So I bring in that yardstick across, and pretty soon I got a yes. So I drew a line right down the edge of that yardstick. Then I got to the top, of, and went up to the top of the line with that yardstick, and then I came, I was coming down, and again, when the edge of the yardstick gets to the intersection nearest the harp, give me a yes. So this thing was coming down very slowly, very slowly. Pretty soon it said yes, and I drew another line. Now that X just happened to be in this very center of an intersection. So I just mentally placed myself 
in that intersection. I was facing one way, and I just asked, is the harp up this street? And they said, no. I turned to the right and looked up that street in my mind's eye, and I said, is the harp up this street? And they told me yes. I said, is it on the left side? They said, no. Is it on the right side? Yes. You know, just a series of yes and no questions. So I said, okay, I'm going to count houses on the right side of this street, the corner house is number one, the next house is number two, number three, etc., etc. I asked the dowsing system, can I do that? And it said yes. So I'm just holding the harp, a picture of the harp in my left hand, and I just said, is this uh, harp in this in house number one? And it told me yes. So, and also, when that happened, when I got a yes, I just got a flash of somebody carrying that harp into the house from a pickup truck. Oh. And it just, you know, one of those things, and it happens frequently, very frequently. It's just another mind phenomenon thing. And so I called up the lady, and I told her about the pickup truck and told her which house and all that. And she said, well, I'm going to, uh, I'll drive, she said, that's not very far from here. I'll drive down and see if I can see what kind of neighborhood it is. Uh-huh. So after a while, she called me back, and she said, well, that's not a very good neighborhood, but, the, but there is a pickup truck sitting in the driveway. So she really <laughs> thought I was on to it. So I said, I don't know how you're going to find out if they got your harp. You just can't go ask them, you know. Can't go knocking at the door. <laughs> <clears throat> so what she done, she called the detective that had been working on that case. Now, this, is, this harp had been stolen like two and a half months ago in the police had given up on it already. Uh-huh. But, but she called the detective that had been working on the case, and she said, hey, somebody's seen my heart being carried into this house from a pickup truck. <laughs> and, and the detective said, okay, give me a sworn affidavit from that person, and I will go check it out. Well, <laughs> the, I'm in Arkansas. The affidavit is somebody in Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They wouldn't have believed any for, sworn affidavit. Yeah. But, but anyway, uh, she had... Uh, out of all the houses in, in Oakland and Berkeley, she had six posters made. And she put uh, one on the, well, like she's on this corner of the block. She put one on on, on kind of the back corner of the block, and then, then on the right straight across on the other corner of the block. And, and then she put four of those posters on the corner where the house was facing the house. Yeah, and the harp and the and the poster said reward. This harp was stolen. She she made a picture of the of the uh, harp and yeah. enlarged it. Said reward. This harp was stolen December seventeenth and was last seen in this neighborhood. Aha. Uh -huh. So when she put those four right there facing the house, you know the guy knew we had him pretty pinned pinned down. You know, <laughs> and uh, so what what we done. Uh, this guy, he called. He seen. The, he said, "I seen the poster." He said, "Somebody bought a harp, and he didn't know it was stolen." And you know, it's this same guy. I know. Yeah. And we'd like to get it back to you, but we don't want any cops around. <clears throat> so she told him to meet her at a Safeway store, and that was only two blocks from that house. And she said she'll give him the reward money, and he and he brings the harp. He said, "Okay, but if I see a cop within ten blocks." You know, you'll never see near the harp again. So, anyway, uh, they recovered the harp. That harp was in that house, <laughs> and uh, they got the harp back. And she was still curious about who could, who could have stolen her harp. And so I told her, go to the theater and get the names of everybody that had a key to that theater within the past two years, because it was not broken into. Somebody had a key and went and got it. Uh -huh. So she went and she faxed me about you know, 15 or 16 names. <clears throat> and so I'm just going down that list saying, did this person take the harp? Did this person? Pretty soon it said, yes. My opinion told me yes. So I called her up and told her, well, I think this guy might have taken the harp. So she took his name over to the theater manager and said, I think we, I think this guy might have taken the harp. And he said, oh, yeah, he used to be a maintenance man here. So he looked in the card file and, he, and said, where did you say the harp was found? And she told him the house, the address that we'd found the harp. He said, well, that was probably him because that's where he lives. <laughs> you know, so so it all, it works. It really does work. 
And yeah, that story was you have to trust so, it. A lot of people don't trust their instincts. Well, something get, like yeah. this. <laughs> <Sorry>. But uh, <laughs> but tell how that led to the founding of your organization. Okay, the this this woman that that owned the harp. She's a Ph.D. there in Berkeley, and she teaches uh, uh, psychology. She's a Harvard graduate. She teaches psychology to medical students at a medical college there. So. Uh, I got to be pretty good friends with her when I found the harp and found and told her who, uh, you know, who stole it, and uh, you know we became pretty good friends. And, and she was told me that you know she she's living on liquid. She really has some bad digestive problems, and so I worked on that remotely, and the digestive problem went away. And she, uh, you know, she started eating solids again. So. Uh -huh. and she was pretty impressed with that, and so she went back to the staff and faculty there, there at, the, at the school where she was working, and she was telling those doctors, well, you guys laughed at me when I told you uh, Dowder was going to find my harp, and also, he fixed my stomach. You guys have been working on that for a couple of years, you know, <laughs> and so I, so they got really curious about who this guy is back here. And so they actually invited me to, to come out and speak to the staff and faculty of that college. And so I went out and I talked. There was about 30 people there, I guess, and the staff and faculty, plus other uh, people around, you know, other professional people. And <clears throat> I was talking about, I, I told how I doused and found the harp and worked on her stomach and, and all that, and I was just... I told several uh, healing stories. I'd been involved in a lot of successful healing stories. Yeah. And uh, I just, uh, I, I finished it. Well, I was also talking about the, the possibilities, you know, just the mind tunnel. And I said, if I could get enough people uh, around a contaminated water source, we could change that we could make that water drinkable by changing just with the power of the mind changing one uh one uh, contaminant you know just changing the contaminant a little bit uh, a molecule one molecule and that changes the whole thing and make that thing drinkable yeah i was talking about well and we might clean up toxic waste dumps you know because they drill down and they they insert a lot of uh uh Radiation type stuff, you know, low level radiation stuff yeah. down way down in the earth, and you know that, well, that bothers me because if that ever got in our water supply, that would really be bad. And I also was talking about well, and we might even be able to close the hole in the ozone. Back in those days, everybody was talking about the hole in the ozone. Yeah. Anyway, I I really was touched. I was touching some woman back there, and. She was just, uh, I finished my talk saying what I'd really like to do is to start an organization here in Fedville, Arkansas, so I can uh, teach people how to do this, how to how to use the mind, how to really use this mind phenomena for the good of everybody, you know? Uh -huh. And so I just finished, you know, talking about that. I'd like to do that. Well, this woman walked up, and she said, uh, I'm involved in several grant organizations and foundations, and I want to finance whatever you want to do in Fayetteville, Arkansas. <laughs> and so, I remember you saying you were so shocked. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people don't walk up every day and tell you, hey, I want to give you a bunch of money. <laughs> and what I've done... That showed she must have really believed in what you were doing. Oh, yeah, she did. Yeah, yeah, she really did. And well, she believed... Well, she she knew the woman that I'd worked on and fixed her stomach and and found the harp. I mean, that's enough to kind of convince you pretty good, you know. And, you know, and, and what she did, uh, she got my name and uh, my address, and she sent, uh, she said, in a few days you're going to get an application. Don't worry about all that other stuff. <clears throat> all I want to know is the name of the organization and the purpose of the organization. So... So I came up, since we live here in the Ozarks, uh, the Ozark Mountains, I figured, well, I'm just going to call it the Ozark Research Institute, and so that's how it got its name. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I remember we were at a, a, a conference, I think it was at Hamilton Lake down in Hot Springs. 
Yeah, yeah. And that's when you first started saying this was going to become a reality. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And that's been way back. I know it's been over 20 years, hasn't it? It's been, yeah, well, not well. How long has it been? In the- actually, actually, we've been in business about 14 years. Okay, but, but I think it was way back then is whenever you were first... Yeah, we, oh, when she first we, told you about it, we were down at that conference. Yeah. And, we, and yeah. it was kind of like, you know, pie in the sky. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been wanting to do that. You know, I've been saying, hey, I want to start an organization, you know. But, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, she's going to give you this money. A lot of people didn't believe it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, we both know that, the power of the mind. We can visualize. We can create anything we want. Absolutely. You, can. you just have to believe in the power of the mind. Yeah. It's you just, know, that's how I got all the things in my life, too. Well, I remember I remember when you published your first book. Yeah, we were all in that together, so we know how we can create yeah. uh, what you want. Yeah, we did that. Yeah. But I tell people, you have to know what you want. You have to know... Uh, you have to know it in detail. You can't Ooh. be vague about it. Yeah, I've, I've had people say... You know, if you're vague about it, well, then it's not going to happen. You've yeah. got to know exactly what you want to be able to visualize it and see it, that it must become a reality because it's the law of the universe. That's the law, absolutely. The, and that law How you, it, is... You did the same thing because you were visualizing what you wanted. Yes, yes. And that law, the law of, of manifestation or the law of attraction is just as... As powerful as the as the law of gravity. Yes. And if you pick up a pebble, it's going to drop to the ground every time. And and we everything that you put in your mind, and most people, I mean, we manifest everything that we have. We manifest who we are and what we do, just by the way our attitude is and the way we think. But most of us, uh, you don't even realize that. You just walk around and angry at somebody or hating somebody or, you know, and and like brings like it's it's like whatever you put out you get back There's see several... a lot of us our energy is scattered yeah. we're not focused on what we really want to create yeah it's scattered it, it is it's just it's it's amazing and it's wonderful that you can actually create whatever it is you want i have people tell ask me well, can you work on me getting a, a better job i said yeah but you know what do you want to do well i'm not sure <laughs> As long as you're not sure, well, then the, the universe isn't sure that's either. Right, see. <laughs> you know, you talked about the law of attraction, yeah. and that's when I tell people what you fear, you can also draw to you. Oh, absolutely. Whatever you worry about, whatever you're afraid of, you know, that's what, what you bring. In. Absolutely. Every time, that's what you bring to yourself. Uh-huh. You bring that into your life rather than what's good or what, what is, will help you. Yeah, yeah. It's just but... Uh, uh, yeah, you have to be able to visualize it in detail. Yeah, what it is. You can't be vague about it. That's true. And, and uh, that's, that's why I tell people if they're talking about jobs, you know, to see themselves doing whatever it is they want to do. Yeah, that's what you. But you, yeah, you have to make up your mind what you want to do and just set that as a goal and go for it. Uh huh. You know and you know, you said also that. Um, I see the other phone is ringing. I'm not going to answer it, so it may it may do some strange things here. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to have the answering machine is loud too. Okay, it would happen when we're going live here. Yeah, well, I, I yeah. myself. <laughs> I, I forgot to myself. turn that one off. It take my concentration away there for a minute. Okay. Let me get it back on what we were talking about. Well, I didn't. Trouble hear with you. live shows, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't hear you. <laughs> I was doing one a few weeks ago, and a deer came around, was looking in my window. That was a distraction. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that's what I try to tell people: if you visualize what it is you want and what it is you want to do. Yeah. Then you have to release it and believe it's going to happen. That's true. That's you true. you can't uh, question it because then it, I always say you put it out to the universe and let them take care of it. Yeah, and and that's the way healing happens. You know. That's yes. Healing. That's yeah. uh, tell about the first. You know, the, remember one of the very first cases. See, when we first met, we were going over to a group that met every week over in Rogers, which yep. is very close to Fayetteville. Yeah, and that's where we first met, and where you were discovering what you could do, and I was discovering what I could do. Yeah, 
And then and you were the, questioning everything, you, you but might. you didn't know yeah. where it was coming from. Yeah, you and might remember. And the first case I remember you talking about was, wasn't it a boy, a little child with a cleft palate? Yeah, that's true. It was in, in England, wasn't it? In England, yeah, my son was over there, and uh, he met this young lady that had a, an 18-month-old child that had a cleft palate, and yeah. you know, they have socialized medicine over there, and they knew from the moment it was born that he had a cleft palate, and they are going to have to work on it sometime. Yeah. And my son, uh, you know, he called me, and he was talking about that little kid. He would sent me a picture of him, and, and this is just sort of when I first was starting to do this stuff. Yeah, you were just discovering it and didn't even really know what you were doing. Yeah, that's true. How it worked or anything. <laughs> Sometimes I still think I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, that's the same with me. <laughs> and, but, uh, you know, he was telling me that, uh, okay, we, he said, we just took him to the doctor this past Thursday. Uh, this is on a Saturday. He said, we just took him to the doctor, and they examined him and said, it's time to go in there and close up that hole in the roof of his mouth. Yeah. And he said, I really feel sorry for the kid because the way they do it here, they will deaden that. You know, they put something up there to deaden it so they can get in there and sort it. However they close it. He said, and it's such a delicate operation, they don't want him to stick his tongue up before the deadening wears off and put yeah. the stitches out. So they sew his tongue over to his cheek. Ooh. And they tie his hands to the bed. I wonder yeah. if they still do that now. That was 20 years ago. But yeah. But yeah. still, it sounds awful. Yeah, it, it still yeah, it still sounds awful. It's just terrible. But anyway, that just really struck my heart because I love kids, and, and kids are easy to fix. Kids are really easy to uh, to work on. Because they're anyway, very trusting. I just uh, sort of got in a meditative state, and I went just, in my mind, I was sitting on these lower front teeth, and he's in Banbury, England, and I'm here in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Yeah. But in my mind, I'm sitting on these lower front teeth looking up at the hole. And I'm just saying affirmations like, this child's system will produce a proper cell to fill up that hole. And in my mind's eye, that was just getting smaller and smaller. And I'd done that. Now, this was a Saturday afternoon when my son told me that. And I'd done that uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, on Thursday, they were going to do it. So four days, I could always get back there. What, do you a, just work on them for a certain length of time? Or yeah, what? 10 minutes, maybe. 10 or 15 minutes. Well, that's all that you have work on them then? Yeah, and I've done that for three or four days, four, four days, and so by by Wednesday, in my mind's eye, that hole was totally closed up. So they were going to take him to the doctor the following Thursday, and so well that next Thursday after I'd quit work on him. Anyway, Saturday came around and my son called me and I said, "Hey, how'd the operation go?" He said, you know, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. You know, we'd taken him uh, last Thursday, and they said it's time to close the hole up. We took him back this Thursday, and they were going to put him in the hospital. And so the nurse was checking him in there. The woman at the desk was checking him in. And the doctor walked out of his office there and said, and just looked in the kid's mouth and said, let's see what we got to do to this kid. And he looked up there, and he raised up with a puzzled look on his face and said, what are you checking him in for? And the nurse said, well, you're going to do his cleft palate this afternoon. And he looked again and <laughs> said, he doesn't have a cleft palate. You have the wrong child here, or you have the wrong record. Or, you know, <laughs> couldn't believe it. And, and that kid, that hole had totally closed. And, uh, you know, the kid, had, we've had him over here two or three times to spend two or three months with us in the springtime, you know, just yeah. school vacation. And he's in Oxford now, I guess, doing, going to school. That shows it's been about 20 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. And, and one more that you might remember, dear Lord, <clears throat> about the Thursday night group we used to go to. Yeah. We worked on a little kid that had not been born, and he's, he's really still in, in the, the uterus. Yeah. And they had discovered that his, that his intestines were outside of his body. Oh, wasn't well, going right. The intestines were outside of his body, and so the whole group, we were working on him just to try to get the intestines back in, just every how the well, system Well, did the doctor know that from x-rays or something? Or yeah, what? yeah, from x-rays and the sonogram or whatever, however they done it. Yeah. And when that kid was born, those intestines were all the way back in, and all he had was just a little round scar right there where, the, where they were out. <laughs> I thought you might have remembered that. I don't remember that one. Yeah. <laughs> but I know 
Uh, I do remember the group meetings, and you had so many questions because you weren't sure yeah. how this was happening or what was causing it. Because, like I said, you were a military man before this, very yeah. logical. Yeah, I knew how to march. That was about all. Well, I remember your wife, you know, and Gladys doesn't mind me telling the story, but when she first came to our meetings, it was like she thought she was coming into a witch's den. It's yeah. the devil, <laughs> because she was not into any of this. Well, you know how she got there, though? You know, she had, she had, had uh, that bypass, a quadruple bypass surgery, and I had all the group working on her remotely, and she recovered so fast that the doctors were totally surprised. So then she decided she'd start going to that group. But, you know, she first she kept saying almost like, well, what's happened to my husband? This is not the man I'm married to all these years. You know, he's a military man. Yeah, all of a sudden true. now he wants to be a healer. Yeah. So, <laughs> it was like a total uh, about face, a total turnaround. Yeah, that's true. But this was like this was what you were supposed to do with the rest of your life, you know. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And we're doing it. We're like you. We're traveling all over, or I'm traveling. Yeah, and, you know, I know because I've met you sometimes in airports. We pass ships yeah, and pass them the night. <laughs> yeah. About the only time I really get to talk to you anymore is between planes or yeah, something. What? But you travel all over the world uh, lecturing and teaching this now, yeah. don't you? Yeah, I do. I've uh, We spent six weeks in Australia uh, last year, and then uh, we, we're back over this year, well, in November, actually, for a month in um, Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. And we've been to Canada, Nova Scotia, all over the, you know, all over the place. And you've been to Europe, too, don't you? Yeah, I've been to England. Uh-huh. And we're going to Germany after the first of the year. You going to work with a translator over there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I have to do in some of those countries. Well, in fact, there was a woman here from Germany at our school last week. Oh, uh-huh. And she's setting it up, and she's probably going to be our translator. Well, with me, uh, I've been running into people in the last few weeks or so, the last month, couple of months, that are pulling me toward China. Yeah. So I guess that's where I'll be going <clears throat> next year. I've been invited to Russia two or three times. I just haven't got it together yet. Yeah, I've been there. You've been there, too, haven't, been, haven't you? Uh, not to Russia, no. Okay. Well, it's very possible because they're very much into this. Yeah, I know it. Yeah. And there's had, a lot uh, of this going on all over the world. That's what people don't understand. It's yeah, very, had, uh, very popular. I had a teacher here last week, one of my teachers. He been to Russia several times. He's written a couple of books. It's been translated into Russian. Yeah. So and he says they're really interested in it. So hopefully I'll I'll get over there sometime. Uh huh. Well, I think you're like me. We're just going to keep doing it, keep going, and sure traveling and spreading it. Yeah, that's true. And I think that uh, we'll we'll be drawn to where we're supposed to be. That's all. You know. Yeah, and that's why. Well, it's like we're supposed to be awakening this and people everywhere that the mind is more powerful than people think. Oh, absolutely. They don't know how powerful their minds are. Yeah, yeah. You can. And that when we become sick, we make ourselves sick for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And if we make ourselves sick, we can just as easily cure ourselves once we understand the power we have over our mind. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> you just got to understand that that uh, you can connect into that that whatever it is, <laughs> get into that energy, and uh, you can... Uh -huh. I always say them. I don't know what other things them, they call it. Them, that's what I They give me all this stuff. They channel all this stuff through me. Yeah. And yeah, they work through you. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And see, I've been talking the last several weeks about John of God down in Brazil. Yeah. Because I have people, one, uh, one friend who went, goes down there and works with him. And it's the same thing. Yeah, I've uh, I've met several people that have been down to see John of God. But I know you don't want to do what he does. This one last lady I talked to said he sees it's two thousand people a day. No, I can't. No. As much as eight bus loads, but he doesn't see them all. They just come into this one room. Just being in that proximity is enough to heal them. Yeah. Yeah. So here again, I think it has to do with the mind and expectations yes. and all of that. And there's faith, you know, there's faith that, that they're yeah. going to get healed, and, and they heal themselves, actually. 
and it's uh, it, it just works different ways on different people. Mm-hmm. But uh, we know it is true. But you know what I was thinking when you were talking about the little boy in England, that this work has to be done with love and compassion. Oh, absolutely. I don't think it could happen without that. You can't go into it as a business and <laughs> be abstract and... Uh, uh, you can't distance yourself from the person. You have to really want to help that person. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's why I don't think uh, negativity can even enter into any of these kind of healings. No, no, it can't. You have to be pretty clear. You have to be pretty clear. And, <clears throat> and you know, in my classes, and I do two-day workshops, and yeah. I do those all over the world, or, you know, mainly, and, and I tell those people the very first day, that everything that I'm going to tell you is totally impossible by all established scientific standards. <laughs> and it is. There are no I'd standards. love to prove the experts wrong. <laughs> and I do, too. Yeah. I do, too. I, uh, we've had such miraculous healings lately. I mean, absolutely. Uh-huh. But what do they say when you tell them that? Well, my classes... Yeah, your classes. Well, well, they they agree that, you know, there there are no standards. You know, I mean, how is it possible that I can sit right here and heal a broken back or a broken neck or or whatever a thousand miles or ten thousand miles away? How is that possible? See, there there is no scientific standard for that. So it's it's totally impossible by all rational scientific explanation or whatever. Yeah, but that's when we get away from what is, what's rational and what's accepted. Oh, uh, they're using their logical mind. Yeah, that's right. And it is the other part of them. It happens all the time, just like the little boy, you know, with a cup palate. I mean, yeah. Uh, well, see, that's not. what a lot of people say. Like with John of God, they said the Catholic Church is angry at him because they said nobody's supposed to be able to do these things except Jesus. Yeah, well, who do you think's doing it? It's the same thing that he did. (laughs) And we all have these abilities. We all have the ability. People who go to my two-day workshops, at the end of the second day, most of them can start doing healing work. Actually, Uh truly doing healing work. In, in well, the, I've had two classes in the last uh, couple of weeks, and they've been calling me today saying they're getting amazing results. So we're yeah. able to pass on what we have learned. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. But still, Harold, I don't think there's some people out there who are not going to be able to do it. Everyone that comes to the class can't get it. That, no, that's just no. If you're, if you're a skeptic, you're not going to get it. <laughs> Or or if they're going to use it for the wrong reason. Yeah. Well, I think the way this healing works, for me anyway, I have to I have to have that love flowing. So, you know, and that, that pure intent. So I don't think I could ever hurt anybody. That's the same with me. I couldn't either because we go into it with the right motives. Yeah. And I don't think anybody because you know, <clears throat> the law of manifestation. If you try to hurt somebody, what goes around comes around. You it does. It to yourself. See. So it's pretty safe. And a lot of these things that people put out, I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end when it comes back. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. They say it comes back ten times. Yeah. The <laughs> amount. So I'd rather have the positive come back than the negative. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. But uh, you said, you, you did say when we set up the show we were going to reminisce, and I said certainly because we've known each other a long time. Yeah, I think we are. But... Uh, <laughs> You said you also had some other stories that I hadn't even heard. Well, you want to bring up some more of those? <clears throat> yeah, the, I could uh, tell you uh, a, a lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are some of the most amazing, besides the ones you've already talked okay, about? Okay, one of the most amazing that I've done recently, and this is absolutely hard for anybody to believe, but it's documented. Uh, I've done a workshop. Uh, in Conway, Arkansas, uh, this woman, she has a couple of sons. One was in Iraq, and one was in construction down in New Mexico. Yeah. And so, you know, she was talking about her sons and, you know, just really proud of them and all that. And so after that workshop, uh, we had another one (coughs) the following weekend or whatever it was in uh, uh, Marina del Rey in California. Yeah. 
And so we had gotten there on a Thursday, and, you know, they don't feed you on the airplane much anymore. So we went to the restaurant. We were hungry, and I just ordered some food, and my cell phone rang. And it was this woman from Conway, Arkansas, and she said, you know, I'm on my way to El Paso. And I said, what's going on? She said, my son, who's in construction in uh, uh, New Mexico, just, he's a heavy equipment operator, but he had a real bad uh, accident, broke his neck, uh, he's in a coma, knocked a big chunk out of his head, <clears throat> and they airlifted him to El Paso. So she's driving down there, and that's a long ways from here. Yeah. And she said, you know, would you work on him? She said, the doctors, they're not sure they can do anything with the neck because it's broken so bad, you know, it's just really... Really mangled up, and he just in a coma, and he probably figured he'd be paralyzed anyway. Yeah, yeah. He's well. He's in a coma. He probably couldn't have moved. Yeah. <clears throat> Asked me to work on him, so I just we just went on up to the room, and I just sat in a meditative state. And the way I do that, I just bring the person to me, the essence of that person. Okay. Yeah. And then I just get inside. I got inside. And, you know, in your imagination, you can do anything. In your mind's eye, you can fly around the room. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, and you can, if you have a pretty good idea what the inside of the body looks like, you can <clears throat> yeah, work so, on it, you know. So when I, I got in there, I got up inside his spine, and I went right up to where the, the neck starts, you know, just by the brain stem. And that really looked like that was really mangled up. So I have tools, and, you know. And I just put, psychic tools. <laughs> yeah, yeah, psychic tools. And I just put that neck back together and just glued it back together with, I just call it God's healing energy, okay? Just put that all back together. And it was you had just, to do it piece by piece or what? Well, I just sort of put it back, you know, it's just kind of hard to explain. <laughs> it's kind of hard to explain, but I just put that all back together. Yeah. And I got back out, and then I, you know, had his, uh, what I do, I opened up the top of his head so I can... You know, I can see into the to the brain and all that. And so I'm just putting the energy in the brain because you heal yourself. And I just tell it, okay, heal. You know, just telling his brain to heal the neck and make sure it's okay and blah, all that stuff. Okay, and then I felt pretty good about it and just left him there. <clears throat> about three hours later or four hours later, my phone rang again. That was his mom. She says, I'm on my way back home. I said, what happened? She said, well, I was driving down there, and, and her cell phone rang, and she said it was my son. And he said, Mom, something happened, and, and I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with me now. And he said, uh, you don't <laughs> have to drive down. You can come on back. And, and you know, those doctors are totally, uh, absolutely, you know, they don't want to think about that. And I really enjoy, uh, you know, I have nothing against doctors, but I like to make them scratch their head and wonder. You know? yeah, that's what I mean with me, too. They're only doing what they're taught, and they think of the body as a machine, and yeah. they're, they, they're valuable in a lot of cases, but they don't realize that there's much more to the body than just a machine. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's why, what I know a lot of the doctors I've been working with are coming around to the idea that the mind can heal. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, so there's, not, no, there's nothing wrong with doctors, but it is, they're going to have to start embracing this other attitude, this other belief to yeah. incorporate it, I think. Yeah, I have a good friend who's a doctor. He's just a regular, uh, uh, regular allopathic doctor. Uh -huh. And I went into his office one day, and he was just really having pain. He had a, a hernia or something, and it just was really about to kill him. And so I just I told him, well, look, lay down there on your table. Let me work on you. <laughs> <laughs> and he reluctantly laid down there, and I worked on him, and the pain went away. Okay, and so the next time I went in to see him, he's a good friend, and he said, hell, I've got a herniated disc, and he had a, he had a uh, an X-ray of that. He said, "See, it's this one right here." You know. And I said, "Okay, I'll see if I can do something about it." So I went home and I sat down and just went back in there and fixed the herniated disc. Next time I seen him, I said, "How's the how's the herniated disc?" He said, "Oh, that got okay." 
He said, but now I got bursitis. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> he wants you to fix everything while yeah. you're at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but mm. you know when see when you do something with intent, and somebody sees that, I mean, it happened. You know, if it if you. Uh-huh. So there's not a lot of room to be so skeptical about it. If I say, okay, I'm going to do this, and I do it, and it happens, just like I said it was, then, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, who, who can deny it, you know? Well, you know, there's skeptics out there, but they said there's never going to be enough evidence for the skeptics. Yep, that's true. And then for a believer, they don't need evidence. Except if one really gets sick, and he'll, he'll hear about it. People. And then you begin thinking, well, I wonder if there is anything to this. Yeah, then not. they'll come to me. <laughs> <laughs> then they become a believer, you know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but um, aren't there cases where you're not supposed to heal them? Oh, yes. And I I make it a point always to ask the system or their high self or whatever your mindset is. I say, is it okay if I work on this person? And then I'll just get an answer, yes or no. I mean, it's just, it's just not words. You, but you, just, you feel it in your head then? Or? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, you said it's yeah. not words. Do you just feel the answers? Yeah, it just says yes. It's just like a great idea. You know, you get an idea like the light bulb goes on, you know. Yeah. And uh, and, and that's how it happens. It just, it just says either yes or no, but it's just, it's just energy that, that I know that I can interpret what it says. Yeah. That's yeah. what people say. Do you hear them in your head? It's not really words. No. It, like someone speaking, but you you know, yeah, you I guess the feeling of knowing. You know, would that be better? Yeah, and, and a lot of times, well, not a lot, but but several times I've gotten you know, they say, nope, this person's going through some process that they got to finish before they can be healed. You know, no. and so you just you know you don't argue with them. You say, okay. <laughs> It's something they have to experience. Yeah, that's right. They're going through something that they have to experience. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I've had in my work, too, because, you know, in my work, the subconscious will talk to to me and tell me what's going on. Yeah. Sometimes it'll say, no, we're not supposed to deal this because it's something uh, they contracted for in this life, Mm -hmm. and they have to go through it themselves for whatever reason. Yeah. Maybe it's karma. Who knows? But it is something they have, they have to do work through. Yeah, that's. And uh, then sometimes uh, <laughs> it'll come through and say they're supposed to heal themselves. Yeah, that's true. Because there's something they're going to learn that way. Mm-hmm. So sometimes they're not supposed to do it. Yeah, and and my system, what I call my system, which is my angels and guides and spirit guides and God and you know the whole system. Yeah. Uh, I just ask, and sometimes they just said, "No, nope, you can't do it. That person don't need, can't be healed." You know. And I, I've, I've worked on a lot of uh, drug addicts that just got off the drugs. A lot of alcoholics that got off the alcohol. People mm-hmm. who smoke that wanted to get off of it. But you they know. really want to. Yeah. They, well, uh, most of the drug addicts, they, uh, they didn't know I was working on them. I used to think I had to get permission consciously, but. But I've worked on so many people who are in a coma or who on, you know, are babies or animals. And I work on a lot of animals. Uh, that you're, didn't talking, get... you're mostly communicating with that other part of them then. Yeah, that higher self, their higher self. And I oh, always ask I'm sort of thinking if the drug addicts came to you themselves or did one of the relatives. No, his mother. You know, usually now they'll say, can you work on them? Yeah, usually the mother Yeah, or the wife or the some the girlfriend or and you're able to take the desire away from them? Yes, I take the desire away from them. I put in the desire to get off drugs and the ability to get off drugs. Yeah. And, you know, it's just a process that you clean out. You know, you're, I don't think you would ever have anything physically wrong with you unless you had some unresolved emotional stuff, you know. Yeah, and now I call it the garbage and, and the luggage, ba- baggage in the garbage we carry around with us. That's it, yeah. And so I can get up there and get rid of all of that emotional stuff. All that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, and most of the time that's the reason they're on, you know, they're either on drugs or alcohol, and, and I can get no. rid of that, and then they don't have any desire for it anymore. That's also what I found, one of the reasons why people make themselves sick, too. Yeah, that's they're Carrying true. all this stuff around with them. Yeah, yeah, it's really true. And I've had people just 
go 180 degrees, you know, from what they were doing. It's just uh, yeah, absolutely. It's it's amazing how this how quick sometimes this stuff works. But that's what I tell a lot of people. It's stuff they're carrying around. They have to forgive the other person. Well, that's important. And get rid of this stuff because that's what they're carrying around and begins to eat at their insides. Yep. You know, but they say, well, I can't forgive them. You don't know what they did to me. Well, as long as they're carrying that around, they're not going to get well because they're hanging on to it, and it's only hurting themselves. That's absolutely true. But you don't have to go into the part like I do. You just go work with them. I just clean it off myself. (laughs) (laughs) You work with that other part of them. Yeah. And you're able to do all of that, but... um, I, I think there is so much to this that people need to explore, and, and I believe now is the time we're moving into this new time when this yeah. is going to be more and more accepted. Oh, absolutely. It is. It is. It's getting more I, and more. I consider us like the underground, yeah. like there's an undercurrent, mm-hmm. and uh, it's there, and it's bigger than people realize, the normal yeah. people on the surface realize but I get a feeling all of this is getting ready to come to the surface, and people are going to be very surprised. I'm sure, because we're, people are being prepared for it. You know, a lot of the kids' cartoons on Saturday morning, they got all this magic stuff, you know. Yeah, and, it's beginning to seep into a lot of shows. Yeah. Okay, and I'm watching the clock because I have to stop at 5 till. But I want you to give out your information so that people can contact you if they want to. Okay. Uh, the Ozark Research Institute is the web page is www.ozarkresearch one word o z a r k r e s e a r c h dot o r g dot org yeah dot org because they're a nonprofit that's yeah. o r g okay. and the the email is o r i at i p a Dot net. What was those letters again? India Paul Alpha I P A. Okay. Dot net. And you want to give out a phone number? Yeah, it's uh four seven nine five eight two nine one nine seven. This mm-hmm. way, if anyone wants to contact you for you to work on people, sure, they can are- if they want to know about your classes, and yeah, if they want well, to ask you to come and do workshops anywhere. If they look on the web page under workshops, they'll see where I've been, where I'm going in the next three or four months. Yeah, that's what I have on mine also. And so, just like, and if they want to attend or if they want to um, to ask you to come and do something, they can do it then. Yeah, uh, just like uh, in the next. For five or six weeks, I'm going to be in San Antonio, Texas, and I'm going to be in Oklahoma City. I'm going to be in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm going to be in Oakland, California, and another place in Northern California. And I'm, you know, I'm just <laughs> anyway. It's all on there. <laughs> I know that's why I'm enjoying. Now I got a couple. I got one week home anyway before I have my next class. But <laughs> you know, it seems like the universe gives us plenty of energy to do what we have to do. Oh, it does. I'm, you know, I'm 74, and I got more energy than most 40 year olds. Well, you know, I'm your, I'm of 75. Oh, are you? Well, yeah, we're the same age, yeah. and so we're both doing what we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> and you know, that's we, what I mean. It doesn't fall into this paradigm. You know, you have to get old. There's a lot you can do with the yeah. rest of your life. That's true. But, you know, you know, <laughs> okay, I'm going to give my information, and then we'll be signing off. But uh, Harold, I want to thank you for being with us. Well, thanks, Dolores. I, I'm really happy to do it. And uh, you know, anytime you need me to do something, let me know. Okay, and it's been wonderful talking to you. You too. Okay, now my information, my company is Ozark Mountain Publishing. So my website is Ozark Mountain, abbreviated, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. And our 800 number is 1-800-935-0045. 1-800-935-0045. Zero zero four five. Okay, and thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, Dolores. Bye bye. Bye bye.
If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.